Uh, today we will be talking about using green metrics to monitor your infrastructure's carbon footprint. <coughs> so my name is Ida. Um, for the last two and a half years, I've been working for Grafana Labs as a software engineer. Um, my passions are promoting the gender diversity in tech, and I'm trying to be an advocate for that. And hi, I'm Nikki. I'm also a software engineer at Grafana. I'm also a CNCF uh, environmental sustainability tag uh, contributor, co-chair of the Green Reviews working group. Um, the tag ENV has been in place since a bit over a year now, and our focus is uh, advocating for green IT in the cloud-native ecosystem. So, uh, since Nikki joined Grafana, she has been a great advocate and uh, she, she has been promoting the topics of green metrics and sustainability in cloud. And she got us together with Leonor, Sophia, Adam, and myself, and other great folks that are not, in, not on this slide, to join a hackathon project uh, that was uh, deploying Kepler um, in our dev cluster. And that's how this talk came about. So today we will be talking about environmental sustainability uh, and cloud computing. Um, we will be focusing on not on actually how to reduce carbon emissions, or we won't be giving advice, but the first step to reduce your emission is actually know uh, how much you're emitting. So on this picture from, from uh, Climatique, you can see that the share of global CO2 emissions um, for data centers are in the range between 2.5% and 3.57% which is of quite a big range. Uh, it's in front of aviation, shipping, and the rice cultivation and other sectors. For me, what was the shocking thing on, on this picture is that data centers are actually emitting more CO2 than uh, aviation. I think that's quite high. And also, the range is pretty big. If you think about it as the um, share of uh, global CO2 emissions, I think this, this picture shows us that um, there is still, it's not easy to collect uh, data on emissions um, in the data centers, and also that we don't know, we don't have the information of actually how much we are emitting exactly. So why to implement green ops for your company or your business? Um, I think the term net zero become, became a buzzword uh, by 2050. I actually didn't even know what it means. I don't know if you do. But uh, it means actually 90% reducing your emissions and 10% uh, neutralizing. So it's a pretty big commitment. I think the term was uh, coined in the, during the Paris Agreement uh, talks. And uh, many, even very known corporations, are committing to net zero by 2050, which is actually a quite tough thing to meet. But still, we have some time. Another good reason is saving costs. So sometimes when we reduce our resource usage, we also reduce costs. For instance, getting rid of zombie clusters, zombie pods. We're saving uh, some, uh, some costs, some energy. Another great thing to do is uh, optimizing your app performance, uh, or in general performance. So if your app is more efficient, you're saving energy, you're saving, um, you're implementing green ops. Another thing uh, is product differentiation. So your company can do something else, what the competitor is not doing. It's great for marketing, for investors to see that you, you work for a green company, also for customers, that they, are, they feel better about uh, using your product, and also for maybe potential employees who, whose values are aligning with your company's values, uh, green values, so to say. Um, yeah, governments all over the world are coming up slowly with some regulations about compliance on sustainability. Uh, for instance, uh, the EU, Actually, the Council, EU Council came up with the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which says that the publicly traded companies will be required to, to report their carbon emissions for the 2024 financial year uh, by year 2025. So still some, not that much time. And also the US SEC is uh, debating the climate disclosure rule, which um, also makes the companies show the investors how great would they tackle the climate crisis and how their business model will survive the emerging climate crisis. So what are actually, so there are categories for emissions, um, scope one. Scope one are direct emissions. So for instance, you're driving your car, you're f burning fuel, uh, scope one emissions. Scope two, it's uh, you're using your laptop, it's plugged into electricity, 
uh, scope two emissions. If you're using your laptop, the hardware was produced and used up some energy, scope three emissions. What does it mean for cloud? Um, I mean, in cloud, we don't care about scope one. Um, that's not something that uh, is included. But we care about indirect emissions. And for instance, the electricity used in private cloud, that's scope two emissions. Scope three emissions are, is electricity used in public cloud, for instance. This, shows, this picture shows that the scope three is makes a much bigger share of emissions um, in global emissions uh, from the cloud users. That does, not, that, that does not mean that the public cloud is actually less sustainable or emits more uh, carbon footprint. It only means that that's the thing we need to focus on, uh, reducing or, yeah, to reduce. Actually, the opposite is usually true, that the private cloud is actually less sustainable than the public, but Nikki will talk more on that. Yeah, so let's talk about um, cloud-native energy and carbon monitoring. So uh, AWS has shared this diagram about the responsibility of customers versus AWS in the cloud. So AWS is uh, responsible for the sustainability of the cloud itself. That means cooling, which is one of the most energy-intensive parts. Um, and electricity supply, for example, ensuring that the supply is from green or renewable sources, or um, carbon offsetting is a strategy that is used a lot um, by the hyperscalers, whereas customers are responsible for sustainability in the cloud. That includes application design, um, and that includes auto-scaling, for example, uh, and that also includes scheduling. For example, if you schedule certain batch jobs that are not time-sensitive in regions that are using less, uh, that are less carbon-intensive. So there are ways to do this. That's called carbon-aware scheduling. So the problem is that we don't have granular data on the uh, energy and carbon emissions of or cloud-native software. And so this, for example, is a screenshot of uh, um, AWS's customer carbon footprint tool, which is useful for long-term carbon accounting, but not uh, for engineers. There is a three-month data lag, so uh, when the EC2 instance uses the electricity, you get the uh, emission in this, in this dashboard three months later. So this is the issue of top-down versus bottom-up uh, energy and carbon um, accounting. Moving on to Kepler, which is an energy monitoring tool that exports to Prometheus. So uh, what is Kepler? It's a Kubernetes-based efficient power level exporter. It was created by Red Hat slash IBM, and it was recently donated to the CNCF. It's a sandbox project. Um, how does it do energy monitoring? The first step, it aggregates uh, the energy metrics. So it uses either RAPL or an estimation model. RAPL is an Intel technology that aggregates uh, energy metrics from the processor and, and exposes those metrics. And there is an issue, of course, uh, in the virtual machine environments, you don't have access to RAPL because of the hypervisor. So in AWS, the RAPL is not available. Even in some bare metal AC2 instances, RAPL is not available. Um, there is uh, a workaround for this. If RAPL is not accessible, Kepler falls back to an estimation model. So this is actually trained data on different types of compute through a machine learning model. There are issues with that as well. Um, but that is, uh, there's already a pre-trained model that's done. And so you just use the data from it. Uh, and so that's uh, the estimation model. Then it uses eBPF to attribute power to process to pods. So eBPF lo will look at the uh, energy metrics. Uh, and associate those with the C group ID and the container and pod that are um, matching. And so that way you can have pod level energy metrics as well as node level energy metrics. And you can use then Prometheus to query for the namespace, uh, for example. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, it exports the metrics to Prometheus. Some issues that I mentioned, there's no access to Apple and VMs. There's also some security issues. If you have uh, energy data that is like less than 50 seconds interval, then you have some, you maybe liable to the, uh, what is called the platypus attack. So this is a fun fact, it's very interesting. What it is is that you can infer cryptographic keys based on the energy consumption uh, by it. So you need to increase the, the intervals to avoid this to, I think, 15 seconds. And eBPF, uh, well, with Kepler, we had to uh, read the kernel header files. So in some AMIs, the kernel header files are not installed by default. Um, some in GCP, I believe, are, but uh, on the ones that we were using, they weren't. So we had to do this manually in ways that I am not allowed to say. <laughs> Maybe it involves some pseudo. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it was a dev cluster, so, but it doesn't scale, so that's the issue if we want to move from dev to prod. There are issues that we need to tackle. Uh, so. so now we're going to look at some panels and queries. So this one is the carbon emissions in our cluster running in US East 2. Uh, we looked at three nodes, so we used a, a node label selector uh, to just uh, target those nodes that we wanted in the uh, namespace that we wanted. Um, and what we're doing in this query is first um, see the Kepler container joules total that aggregates GPU, CPU, memory, and other like energy processes that we just talked about, the whole other um, setup. Uh, and we're looking at the namespace uh, hosted Grafana. Um, we used a, a hard-coded variable for uh, the watts per second to kilowatt hour. This is a standard conversion of energy metrics. So this one is, that's a set hard-coded metric. Another co uh, hard-coded variable in this case is the carbon coefficient, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, in the first part of the, of the query, we're getting the kilowatt hour, uh, so the Kepler metric with a kilowatt hour um, multiplication, so the, well, the, the, the conversion. So we get that per hour. In the second part, that can be improved. We are trying to get the hours of samples. There are issues if there are uh, certain hours with no samples, this, this, there would be an issue with this query. So we welcome you to uh, you know, propose enhancements and improvements um, as well. There are definitely other ways to do this, um, but this is what we're working with. And so, yeah, we get the CO2 grams per kilowatt hour per day. The carbon emission data, like we said, we use some carbon coefficients. These are, the sources are various energy agencies. Um, we did look at the Cloud Carbon Footprint tool, uh, which I believe is maintained mainly by ThoughtWorks, and uh, they have hard-coded this data. Ideally, we would use uh, live carbon emission data. For example, there's What Time API and Electricity Maps that are doing fantastic work. I think Electricity Maps works with Google as well for um, carbon hour scheduling. So yeah. Um, there's another panel that we thought could be useful, maybe, if you decide to implement Kepler, which is power consumption per pod or tenant ID. Um, if, you want to, if you decide to implement Kepler on your clusters, this could be great to show your customers that they would know how much uh, power consumption their application has, or for engineering teams to know like between releases, if the power consumption changes, if it increases, decreases, if new features are enabled, if something happens to the power consumption. Also for platform teams to see what, which namespaces are, how much power they are using. So I think there are many stakeholders that could benefit from, from this one panel. We also 
uh, built some other panels just for fun to see the total power, power consumption on the cluster for the namespace um, in an hour or throughout the, for a week and also throughout the day how the power consumption goes up and down. So what's next? There are some other use cases that we're looking at. Um, so for example, in the Green Reviews Working Group, we're currently using um, infrastructure that was donated by Equinix to the CNCF. Um, it's called the Community Cluster. And we're now building a pipeline with Cluster API and uh, Prometheus, Grafana, Kepler, um, so that we can uh, measure the energy consumption of various uh, CNCF projects. We're starting with uh, Falco, which is a security uh, tool. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at various scenarios and also like idle um, scenarios, various reconciliations and see how it performs. So we're essentially doing some benchmark tests, maybe use K6, not sure yet. Um, and we're going to then uh, use the uh, uh, metrics from Prometheus in dev stats. So that's like the, the this, it's actually a Grafana dashboard, which is used by the CNCF to look at uh, various, uh, to track various CNCF projects. And so we're going to um, track things. The, it's actually replicated from the uh, tag securities, uh, security assessment, review process, something like that, where they have uh, contributors assessing the security profile of different CNCF projects. So actually, security and sustainability have a somewhat similar like, operating model in some ways. In some ways. Um, other things we're looking at is you know, how to move from dev to prod. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of challenging tech with uh, RAPL and eBPF, but um, and the security issues that we mentioned, but um, we're moving this along. And yeah, and we want to see also, you know, is, can we use this uh, to inform decision making about infrastructure provisioning? Can we inform uh, the metrics that we, uh, that we see, that we uh, export? Can we do some scheduling to deploy pods to the to nodes, for example, there's a study, and I'm sorry, I don't have the, the source of my mind, um, but the, that for servers to optimize their energy efficiency for cooling, the ideal uh, usage would be like 60 to 90. I mean, it's 70 to 90, there's different numbers, um, but some could you know, use this data to schedule according to this optimization. So, uh, and also, um, I forgot to mention that the Green Reviews Working Group, we're going to implement this in the build uh, lifecycle. So when there's a new release, we want to measure the energy consumption and see, you know, did it change? Any feature that was added that changed this, et cetera, um, and give recommendations around this. So thank you for uh, your attention. Uh, we have... Uh, the CNCF Slack channel, tag environmental sustainability. Uh, you're very welcome to join and contribute. We have regular meetings uh, that are open to everyone and uh, happy to talk about this more. Um, and yeah, thank you. Any, yeah. <laughs>
of the uh, data center itself or your... Yeah, the, uh, the public mm -hmm. uh, yeah. cloud data center because, uh, for example, in Google Cloud, you, can, you have this green icon which shows you that this is a, like a green location. Yeah, that's, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, GCP does have like a little leaf next to the regions that are uh, powered by renewables. Um, AWS uh, has a list of the regions uh, the, that are powered by um, renewables. They also use carbon offsetting, so it's not always um, green. Anyway, it's fine. I'm going too much in but <laughs> details. You, you can Google, for AWS, you can yeah. Google there is a list of uh, data centers that are running on renewable energy. And what's also interesting is that the Green Software Foundation, which is under the Linux Foundation as well, is working with, uh, they're, they're trying to work with cloud providers to um, provide the metrics that we just talked about here um, using Kepler. Uh, so maybe this will, in two years, <laughs> we'll have this as a uh, offering, but um, it's, it's very, very difficult. The reason, for example, that there's a data lag in the customer carbon footprint tool that AWS has is for uh, security reasons and legal reasons, it's very difficult to provide that kind of um, data from the data center itself, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I have more general question regarding uh, green energy. As I understood, the green energy is produced by uh, wind, wind turbines and solar panels. Yeah, and probably uh, wave uh, stations which uh, Hydro. generate uh, energy from waves. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, uh, according to graphs, uh, energy producing graphs, uh, this uh, green energy uh, sources produce uh, mo most energy in uh, waves, uh, daily waves. During uh, there are some. Uh, periods of times so then uh, the en green energy, energy pr produced produ production is very low and it cannot co cannot cover uh, the uh, demand of this energy and my question is so whether uh, uh, nuclear energy considered as green energy or not so uh, nuclear is uh, clean clean energy uh, in terms of terminology um, so that's, I've been saying, renewable and uh, green or clean energy um, to include that. Now, this is a question of ethics that is beyond, you know, the <laughs> this presentation. But, I mean, uh, nuclear is not considered uh, renewable, no. but even though it emits much less. It's a clean energy. Uh, this is the terminology. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, you mentioned briefly um, using this as input for scheduling of like batch jobs and stuff like that. I'm up here. Ah, yes. Um, are you aware of any projects that use like um, basically integrate this sort of scheduling with like smart grid um, inputs? You know, when power is available, run batch jobs, this sort of thing. Absolutely. So Keda uh, introduced a carbon aware scheduling um, feature. Uh, so Keda is one. Uh, Keda, you know, full disclosure is primarily there's a you know a lot of maintainership from Microsoft, um, and so Keda definitely does. And we do have some Keda maintainers who come to tag and uh, meetings, and you know have worked with the tag to some capacity. Um, and Carpenter, which was um, primarily it was created through AWS, uh, there is uh, recently, there's an issue open to implement that kind of schedule, uh, scheduling logic, like carbon aware scheduling in Carpenter as well. Um, and there's other tools as well. Uh, actually, the tag, we have a landscape document that we put together, uh, uh, I think, la like uh, almost a year ago. And it's a white paper with a lot of different tools. So if you go on the tag environmental sustainability, 
repository or the website, you'll find this uh, document with more tools. So you mentioned that you get the energy consumption from Intel Rappel. Like, are there mm -hmm. alternatives for like ARM CPUs, AMD CPUs, and if it falls back to the model, is that like a generic model that you can apply to the CPUs from all the vendors, or like how does that work? Yeah, it falls back to the estimation model um, if Rappel is not accessible um, when it comes to Kepler. Um, uh, I don't know of another tool that can... Well, there's, there's Scafond, which is a tool that also does energy monitoring, and it's also used in a cloud-native context. I'm less familiar with it, um, but I don't think they've solved this issue either. All right. Uh, there's oh, a there's question one more question. Okay. Yeah, so d d it's just a, a question on Kepler, but rather uh, if you know the existing uh, tool like KubeBench, for example, but for, um, for, for this purpose, like maybe a tool that will uh, recommend me that I should be running my workloads in a particular region, or maybe use maybe more uh, IRM, uh, IRM instances rather than uh, x86, things like that, that would help me reduce my, my footprint. Ooh, for like specific <coughs> recommendations of things to to change, um, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, definitely, there's some auto scaling. I would say, and, and Carpenter, I think, have been the tools that I've heard of that have helped the most in, in FinOps, in the applying FinOps. So if you can implement that kind of um, smart scaling, then and if you're aiming to reduce your cost in a FinOps way, then you kind of may reduce some of the uh, carbon and energy consumed by your infrastructure. So FinOps. Um, Practices and techniques are, and patterns are often recommended for like the specific things. It also depends what you're optimizing for, because sometimes if you're optimizing for cost, you're not necessarily reducing carbon. Like if you're going from a region that is cheaper uh, with cheaper offerings, it not, it's not necessarily related to carbon. In the same way, if you're optimizing for carbon, you might be actually um, you know, the time spent implementing those solutions might cost uh, more. So uh, as there's also the Green Software Foundation, which has patterns recommended. Uh, and again, the TAG sustainability website might offer more specific solutions. Thank you. All right, that's all we have time for. You, of course, also get your speaker gift. So here you go. Oh, thank you. Now um, we have another break, which I forget for how long. We have another break for uh, 30 minutes, and we're back here at uh, 3.15. So we've got a couple of snacks again.